Come on, Connection Church, make some noise if you're excited to be here. I know it's 10.30, but I believe we can do a little bit better than that. Do you? If you're excited to be at the Connection Church in the place with your family, make some noise. Some people are like, ah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just got to call you out. Anyways, my name is Bob. I'm the student pastor here at the Connection Church, and I get the honor and the privilege to bring you the talk, the message today. We are in our final message of our series, Heroes. Has anybody enjoyed the Heroes series? Well, we're going to wrap it up today with a story with Elijah and Elisha, two of my all-time favorite Old Testament heroes. Man, I can't think of a better day to end it on than the day before Memorial Day when we're talking about heroes. Tomorrow's Memorial Day, and I'm just going to be honest with you, all gave some, but we're going to honor the people who gave everything. Some gave everything, all, for you and for me and being in the military, it is a very, it's a very emotional day for me. I have some friends who didn't just give everything. They didn't just give their life, but they gave limbs. They gave their mind. They gave their, their motor skills, um, PTSD. And uh, I, to me, it's just a special day for those to really reconsider where my, where my freedom lies and the cost that it, it takes to make it. Um, I hope that today I can show you that not only did a hero pay for our cost in this country, but we have a savior who paid the price for our freedom. And I really do, I really do feel like God has given me a message that has helped me see him more clearly, and I hope that I can display, if I could do it justice, so that we could see God in a, in a, in a new and a fresh way that he is the one who gave us everything that we have because he gave everything that he had. And if we can see it, I believe we can respond to it. So we're going to pick up today out of the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 21. Now, if you don't have your Bible, that's page 326 in my Bible, but if you don't have your Bible, you can conveniently follow along on the screens. We'll put the scripture up there for you, or go ahead and follow along, open up your mobile device, the Connection Church, the mobile app, we got the notes on there for you. But picking up 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 through 21, it says, The Lord said to him, this is Elijah that he's talking to, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Melo, Melo Ha. And I thought Texas towns were tough to pronounce. You know what I'm saying? Like Buddha, Buda, Manchak, Manchaka, what is it? <laughs> anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me first kiss my father and my mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. They ate it. Then he set out to follow Elijah, and he became his servant. I've titled today's talk, today's message. We're going to circle around this concept of commitment. Touch your neighbor and say, commit. Commit. What is commitment? Commitment's going all in. It's all, uh, uh, there, I'm sold out. Um, um, I got both feet in the kiddie pool. I'm committed. 
And, I, and, and, and working this topic of commitment, I came up with this title, Stick to It. Stick to it with your commitments. I think it's an encouraging word for someone in the room that if I could just leave you with one thing today, wherever you're committed, stick to it. Stick to it. I believe that's what God gave me to tell you. Wherever you're committed, I'm going to encourage you. Stick to Stick to it. Would you bow your heads and pray? Father, we thank you. You're so good. You're so great, God. I thank you for everyone in the room. Thank you for getting us here safely. Thank you that we will not only just hear about you, but we will experience you in a way that we never have before, that it would form and shape our lives, and we would respond to you differently, that we would... We would be known for people who take a stand, and we are known for our commitments in this county that we are sold out to making Jesus known to everyone that you put in front of us. God, I thank you for the message. Help me hide behind the cross. This is your talk. This is not mine. It's not about me. It's about highlighting you and showing how amazing you are. I also want to take this moment to thank you for the Dallas Cowboys. God, you are good. You are great. I thank you for the Super Bowl season that we are about to, per, to embark on, and I thank you that in the name of Jesus, we will dominate, and that every foe, every enemy, that any, any team that gets in our path, God, they will fall in the name of Jesus like Goliath fell on the battlefield with David because we have faith like that little boy. We thank you for it. We thank you for the ring and the championship. If I can be the chaplain, that would be a great perk, too. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, I know some of you are like, seriously, when are you going to stop praying for the Dallas Cowboys? I want you to know I'm committed to praying for the Dallas Cowboys. I'm going to stick to, you better believe it. So I was in the Marine Corps. I tell people it's the most fun I never want to have again, you know what I'm saying um it was awesome i find myself i'm going to take you back through memory 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 lane being that it is you know memorial day weekend how fitting can it would it be if i could just let you in on my life my highlights so we will start in day 7 of my boot camp experience there was this recruit in my platoon of 90 something his name was recruit kernstock kernstock was one of those individuals who like to just draw attention to himself. Do I have any of those people in the room? You don't even know what you did to draw attention to yourself, but you are just getting the special treatment from the teacher, from the ball. You know what I mean? Well, at MCRD San Diego on a Marine Corps facility where there's drill instructors everywhere, sharks in the water, that's not something you want to walk into boot camp with, that kind of gifting. Like, I just draw attention to myself. So the first seven days of recruit Kernstock's Marine Corps career, needless to say, were interesting. Um, on day seven, we were doing some parade, some drill on the parade deck. You know that. The left face, right, what you saw on the screens. Did you guys see that? That was the Marine Corps silent drill team. That's the best of the best. That is the golden state of all drill in the Marine Corps. They're at the top. It's top shelf. It's amazing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's spectacular. We're not that, though. But you have to learn it because it teaches you discipline. So we're out there on the parade deck for hours, like four, five hours at a time. Just, hooray, face, port, arms, shoulder, arms. <gasps> My knees hurt. Just sign up for this. So recruit Kernstock evidently like doesn't go to the restroom before we go to the parade deck. I'm good. I don't need that. So three hours into it, he says, S -s -s drill instructor, this recruit needs to go to the restroom. To which the drill instructor completely ignores him. Ten minutes later, drill instructor, drill instructor, drill instructor, this recruit needs to go to the restroom. And he completely ignores him. And this is humorous to me. I'm like, how long is this going to go on? Someone is going to get in trouble. I got to go to the restroom, but I ain't saying nothing. I'm keeping quiet, you know what I mean? And he goes, after another 10 minutes, it's been like 30 minutes, he goes, John Stark, John Stark, it's an emergency. <laughs> He's crying like a man shouldn't cry. And John Stark comes up to him and right in his face, he goes, oh, it's an emergency, huh? <laughs> yes, sir then you better hit your lights and your sirens and run to the restroom. Which means, put your hands above your head, 
wave them in a circular motion and go beep boop beep boop. And he ran like this beep boop beep boop all the way a half a mile to the closest head, the restroom. Then when he gets done, we're still standing there at attention waiting for him. And the drone circus has got the biggest smile on his face. He comes back. He's running. He's like, I didn't say don't hit you like the tyrants. And he's like, put him on. So he runs back to us. And he gets there. And he puts him in front of the whole formation. And he says, recruit card stock. Whenever you have to use the restroom for the duration of your time at boot camp, whether you become a Marine or you don't, you will use and hit your lights and your sirens every time you got to go to the restroom. Understood? And he said, I, I, sir, which took a lot of honor, courage, and commitment, if you know what I mean, to commit to that. So for the next mm, 83 days, every time he had to use the restroom, he hit his lights and his sirens, even if the drill instructor wasn't there. Because if the drill instructor's not there, but another drill instructor says to him, Kernstock didn't hit his lights and sirens, you don't want to be that person. That's crazy, right? It's funny. But in the Marine Corps, we have three core values of every, that is the core of our beliefs, what makes you a United States Marine. It's honor, courage, and commitment. Honor courage and commitment so every game that they play with you is to try to instill at least one of your lessons it, it, it revolves around honor courage or commitment those core values this was a lesson in commitment the method the methodology is a little messed up I'm like seriously <laughs> i'm gonna make my kids do that tonight by the way now we're talking about sabrina this is my wife um the methodology is messed up, but the message is so profound. See, see, the drill instructor wasn't looking for someone who would do something crazy. He was looking for a recruit who would do something. He's looking for a recruit that is committed. You following me? What you look at and like, that's crazy. The drill instructor is like, I'm trying to teach him how to be committed no matter how crazy it is. I think that deserves an amen. amen. There we go. Hey, if you'll commit to me, I'll commit to preaching better to you. Just respond and respond. It goes give and take. Check this out. How many times will God ask you to commit to something that seems crazy? Ooh. See, what I want you to see is Kernstock didn't commit to lights and sirens. He committed to making a choice that no matter what you ask of me, I'll do it. No questions asked. That's commitment. And what the drill instructor was looking for is someone who would choose to make a commitment. My first point in commitment is that commitment is a choice. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully, what? Committed to him. Did you know God's looking for a commitment level out of you? What he's called you to do is going to require a commitment. But you can't commit without first making the choice to commit. Elijah, the most powerful prophet, does 14 major miracles in the Old Testament calls down fire from heaven, defeats 400 witch doctors of Baal with his own sword. Miracle after miracle after miracle. God says, I need you to go find a successor, which is to say, your time is up. You're passing it on to the next generation. But you're going to find someone who's committed. His name's Elisha. Go to his daddy's farm. In 1 Kings 19, verse 21, at the end... They set out, then he set out to follow Elisha and became a servant. Elisha was found doing work, already committed to what his father had asked him to do. I think that is a powerful point that we could sit on for a moment, but I don't have the time. But maybe if you want God to take you to a higher level of commitment in your faith, you first need to remain commitment with where he's planted you. Elisha is committed to plowing his father's field. I don't know if you've ever been behind a bunch of oxen before. If you've been in the rear of a bunch of things that are, I don't know how pretty it is to plow. But he remains faithful and committed. So no wonder God says, my eyes are looking for someone who's committed. 
Payal, Elisha. He's got a level of a commitment that I can work with. Elijah goes and throws his coat on him, and, and Elisha ultimately chooses to say, hey, I will come. I will follow you. Your commitment is a choice. To help explain that to you, when I got done with the first sermon, my wife was calling me off the hook. Pick up your phone. Why aren't you picking up the phone? I was like, babe, I'm preaching. <laughs> Why are you calling me while I'm preaching at the house? She's like, you took my keys with you to the church. I can't get to the 1030 service to hear you preach unless you give me the keys. To which I responded with, why don't you just walk? And she was like, babe, I'm not that committed to hearing you preach. <laughs> because <laughs> commitment is a choice. You got to choose it. God's going to ask you to do something, and are you going to choose it? Marriage. Man, isn't marriage a choice? Man, did you know that 50% of marriages in the United States of America, first marriages are ending in divorce nowadays? Actually, those numbers are going a little bit down. Uh, there was a recent study that said, this is crazy. Millennials of all people. Holler at your boy, millennials. Where are you at? It's 1030. We're doing better than the nine. Twelve, we'll have them all here. Um, no, millennials are actually driving down the divorce rate in the United States of America from 50% down to about 40%. Is that nuts? Go millennials! It's not because you're making a commitment to get married, though. It's because you're making a commitment to live with someone outside of marriage. So the commitment age in 10 years ago was about uh, to, to get married. It was the average age was 27. Now it's at 30 to 31. Because it's a choice, right? Whatever you choose, your, your choice is defined. You. Pastor Cole says, you make commitments and your commitments make you. You're defined by your commitments. Is he faithful? Is he flaky? Is he consistent? Is he inconsistent? Will I show up? Will he respond to my text? He always ghosts me. Whatever you choose, chooses you. It defines you. It's Elisha chooses to follow Elijah. He chooses to make a commitment. Your commitment is a choice, but your commitment is a choice that will, check this out, cost you something. Anybody ever paid the price of commitment? It'll cost you something. It'll cost you, it'll cost you your time. It'll cost you your effort. It costs you energy. Anybody like going to the gym and getting in shape? Raise your hands. Come on, be about it. I see you in the back. Yes, I'm committed to carbs. I'm not willing to give up my carbs for the treadmill. Therefore, I am not going, that commitment costs me something. I don't want to pay it. Right? You get up in the morning, you're like, I don't want to go to the gym because this pillow is so comfortable. Did you know that the cost of commitment is comfort? It's outside of your comfort zone that God does his best work. If God calls you somewhere that you're not comfortable with, it means God is growing you. God is developing you. God is stretching you. God is strengthening you. But it will cost you the comfort of the old lifestyle. Comfort costs you. When I went to Camp David after the Marine Corps, I got the opportunity, the privilege, if you will, to serve the President of the United States, George W. Bush. Called him Trailblazer at Camp David, the presidential retreat. Two and a half years. I got to see him multiple times. I got to take my father when I left to the Oval Office. We got a picture with the president. It was amazing. I made a choice in boot camp that, yes, I will go serve the president. But the first question they asked me is, would you be willing to take a bullet for him? No questions asked. The cost of that choice was, would you put your life on the line for a president? I said, yeah. I was young, dumb. My frontal lobe wasn't fully developed. Boys, girls, that's why they go after you when you're 18, because you're ignorant. We'll get you real quick, easy. Ah, you're not committed. You're ignorant. They'll teach you what commitment looks like. You sign the contract. Quit complaining. Um, no, like, it cost me. It cost me a lot. It cost me conversation. See, because I had information that was vital to national security. I knew when the president was coming in for his vacation. I knew when the president was leaving his stay at Camp David. If there was an if, if there was anyone that they would want to get a hold of, like, I'm talking about rolling you up 
terrorists trying to gain information on when and how to maybe go after the president, I was a prime choice. So they monitored my conversation. I wasn't allowed to talk about what I did. But yet, I'm involved with my fiance, who's now my wife, my sexy saint of uh, 10 years, four children, and the awesome food that she... I married her because she was a cook. <laughs> Just being honest with you. Guys, if you're, not, you're in for a long road if she, doesn't, if she knows how to microwave, if you know what I mean. <laughs> no, like, she's amazing. But trying to get to know her over the phone. She's in Texas. I'm on the East Coast. I'm trying to have a conversation with her. She's like, how's your day going, babe? Like, mm -hmm. it's good. <laughs> Man, I want to talk about it, but I can't talk about it because they're on the other end of the line listening to our conversation. It cost me social media. I couldn't even have social media. Millennials are like, <gasps> <laughs> you can't have social media. How do you live? <laughs> Life just goes on. You'd be amazed at when you disconnect how much you connect to those around you. It cost me something. What God's calling you to, what God's asked you to commit to will cost you something. If he asked you to commit to your marriage, it'll cost you something. If he's asked you to commit to your friends, it'll cost you something. For Elisha, it cost him. If you look at verse 20, it says, he said, let me run and kiss my father goodbye. And he said, I'll come back to you. He's, he's saying it's going to cost me my family. In 1 Kings 19, verse 21, the very next verse said, Then he took the oxen, he slaughtered them, and he burned the plowing equipment. He killed the cows and burned the plows. Which is to say he had a barbecue. He cooked the brisket. Maybe God is trying to show us in this that if I'm asking you to commit to me over here, but you're already committed to this over here, See what I'm saying? I want to commit to you, God, in baptism, but my mom is going to tell me that I was baptized at two years old and that if I get baptized at the Connection Church, that she's going to oust me from the family. That happens here at our church. It might be like when I start telling my friends at work that I'm going to church, that they start making fun of me over here. Why would you do that? God's a zombie. If he comes back alive, he's going to be like the zombie apocalypse. That's when Jesus comes. Why would you believe in Jesus? Like, who are you? I don't know, man, but I, there's going, you can't have conflicting commitments. God says you can't serve two masters. Maybe the reason Elisha kills the cows, burns the plows, and says goodbye is because in a commitment with God, wherever he's asking you to commit to, you can't look back. There's no going back. I'm committed to looking forward no matter what. There's nothing behind me. See, if you kill your commitments here, when you get over here, it's less tempting because you got no options to run back to. So maybe someone in the room needs to kill the Facebook app, go online, open it up, delete your account, and delete the app because you're struggling with your committed relationship with Jesus Christ because you keep going on your social media and looking at your old lifestyle. Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if you were in Christ, you were a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, which is to say, I'm not looking back. I'm not defined by what I did. I'm going to kill whatever commitment is holding me down, and I'm going to commit to whatever God is calling me to, to the future, to the hope, to the, to the promise that he has for me. I'm not going back. There's no way. Too many of us keep our options open. Ah, ah, one foot in, one foot out. Cost you something. When I was going to come back to see Sabrina in, uh, it was probably about 2007, 2008, I went through the BWI, the Baltimore International Airport, and I had a TSA agent tell me, check this, she, she said, thank you, sir, when she saw my ID, my military ID, she said, thank you for your contribution to the Marine Corps, to our country. Man, I almost slapped her silly. Somebody like, what? <laughs> you slapped? No. I wanted to tell her that I'm not making a contribution to my country, that I'm committed to my country, and that there's a difference between your contributions and your commitments, because a contribution doesn't cost you jack. Anybody like break, uh, bacon and egg tacos? 
I'm going to help you understand this. I love bacon and egg and cheese tacos, but there's a difference in the chicken and the pig. Do you know what the difference between the chicken and the pig is in the taco? The chicken made a contribution. The pig made a commitment. Maybe that's why 50% of our marriages are failing in divorce in the United States because you got a bunch of men running around in your marriage giving you contributions, acting like a chicken, while you got a bunch of women who are totally sacrificing to this marriage, acting like a pig. I heard someone over here yell out pig before I did. Sir, we will pray for you. You're probably sleeping in the pig pen tonight. It's okay. Girls, the light bulb just went off. You're like... I get it now. That's why my husband has always called me babe. (laughs) Old people jokes, pick jokes in church. It'll cost you. Hey, if your commitment doesn't cost you, it's not a commitment. It's a contribution. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're committed to God. I want to send my kid to summer camp. Guess what? It's going to cost you. You might have to work a part-time job to pay that price, but it will totally be worth it in your child's life. It'll cost you. The cost is always worth it. The commitment is a choice that will cost you, even when it's not convenient. If you look at 2 Kings verse. Chapter 3, verse 11, you'll see that we pick up the the, the story of Elisha later on. It says, but Jehoshaphat, who was king at this time, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Do you know what he's saying? that Elijah recruited Elisha to be his protege. And the moment that Elisha made the commitment, there's no going back. I'm killing every commitment on this side. I'm following you. You did 14 miracles. Elisha will ask for a double portion and end up doing 28 miracles, exactly double of what Elijah did. The first thing that Elijah does to test the commitment level of Elisha is he throws him A bottle of water says, will you be my water boy? Elisha gets the water and he goes, wait, 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 what? Do you know what I did? Do you know what I paid for? I totally committed to you. You want me to be your water boy? Which is to say, it's not like I'm going to feed you high quality H2O like Bobby Boucher. It is, no, when you go speak to the king or you go speak to the nation and you are the mouthpiece for God Almighty, and you have been walking through the desert, I am committed to being your servant at a slave level, which says, I'll wash your feet, I'll wash your hands, I will make sure that you're presentable to do God's work. He's doing all the dirty work again. I didn't sign up for this if I'm Elisha is what I'm saying. I'm not committed. At this. This is, I thought I was going to be your successor, not your slave. But commitment is a choice that will cost you even when it's no longer convenient for you to stay. How committed are you? This is where we find out who's a fan and who's a follower, who's interested and who's invested. My brother-in-law, I love him to death, but he's the biggest bandwagoner in the world. He was Houston all the way up until the fourth quarter of that last game, and he's like, I'm a Golden State fan now. I said, dude, you're a bandwagoner. He goes, bandwagoners never lose. I looked at him and said, bandwagoners are never committed. I'm talking about like Dallas fans. Where are we at? We are the most committed fan base in the country because you have proven it over the last 15, 10, 12 years that even through the thin moments, we still ride or die. I'm not jumping teams. I'm not going to go support Houston. J.J. Watt's great, but I'm Dallas, silver, blue, boys, dim boys, all the way, right? You're a follower. You're not just a fan. See, when you get into where it's convenient to go, the grass is greener on the other side. My marriage, it's not convenient to be married anymore. 
I mean, it'd just be easier to just hop the fence. Man, we had a guy in boot camp who, who literally, he, he jumped the fence in boot camp because it's no longer convenient for him to go through basic training. So he went AWOL. The fence, though, was a runway for the airport that was right across the street in San Diego. So he literally jumped onto the runway as a 747 is trying to land. He almost took his own life by trying to get out of a commitment. Isn't that how it works, though? We do so much damage to ourselves. I promise you, if you would just stick in it through the thick and through the thin, it is totally worth it. It's worth it because Jesus Christ was committed for you. We don't have to be committed without a model. We have a perfect model who committed to the cross. The cross was not the most convenient method of freedom, but Jesus was still willing to pay the price, was he not? It says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame and its sin. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12, 2. See, what breaks my heart is that there is a a lack of appreciation for the price. But it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It It is this one reason we can't appreciate what we're not aware of. My kids don't appreciate any toys that Santa bought for them. Know what I'm talking about, parents? Like Santa bought you this, and then a week later, it's out in the backyard getting rained on, getting mowed on. They stole the bike. You see some other kid riding the bike that Santa bought your son. Why? Because there's no appreciation for it. Why? Because they don't, they're not aware of the price that was paid for that gift. You know what gifts my children do appreciate? The ones they see their daddy go to the, to the store with them and shell out a transaction. My son will be like, my daddy bought me this. It could be the cheesiest gift from dollar store. He's going to hold on to it and pass it down to his kid because it has value to it. I'm talking about you can't appreciate if the price tag doesn't get personal. Memorial Day, we honor the lives of people who celebrated or we honor the lives of people who sacrificed everything so that you and I can live in this great country of ours. Despite your political opinions, despite your political stance, despite what you stand for and you don't stand for, there was someone, some her, him, them, grandmother, grandfather, papa, uh, your uncle, your aunt, your cousin, your son, someone gave their life at some point so that we could be free in this country. That response right there, that praise that you just lifted up, check this out. This is going to blow your minds. That praise is in response to a price tag that you just became aware of. And if I can help you understand that someone paid the price so that you and I can be free physically, then I hope And I pray that I can help you become aware that because of the price tag that a Savior paid for you and me, we can live in freedom spiritually forever and ever with him. Because you see, there is a God who came down to this earth and said, I will be committed to you even when you're not committed to me. For yet while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. He was committed to taking your sin. He was committed to taking your shame. He was committed to taking your punishment. The only thing my God wouldn't commit to is the grave itself. He's not committed in keeping dead things in the ground. If you need new life in your marriage, if you need new life in a relationship, if you need the strength to recommit and stand strong, then all you've got to do is bring the committed one back into the middle in the mix of the of your life. Your praise is in response to the price that Jesus Christ paid for you. That's why it's called a personal relationship with Jesus. What happens when the price tag gets real in your faith? You stay committed in that marriage one more month. You stay committed in that job because you realize you got mouths to feed. You stay committed just for the fact that this commitment thing is bigger than you parents. You're modeling it for the next generation. I'm committed because I'm passing on a level of commitment to my children. My kids are watching me. This is bigger than me. When you bring Jesus into the mix, 
Do I have anybody who's willing to reconnect, recommit in any area of their life? If that's you, I want you to close your eyes, bow your heads. I want to pray for you in this moment. Father, you're amazing. You're great. You're good. God, I ask that you would help us to lean on you, rely on you, trust in you. Thank you that you paid the price. You paid it all. I'm totally free. I'm forgiven. I've got grace and salvation and sonship. Help that become personal to me. Help me to understand that and know that in a way that I never have before. And allow that to overflow into every area that I'm committed in my life. May my commitment be a reflection of your commitment to me. If there's anyone in the room who's never made the commitment to simply just follow Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, this is your opportunity. This is your moment. You know exactly who you are, but the Bible says if you will believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. That's the commitment. I commit to believing in you, confessing you, and trusting you. If that's you, on the count of three, I want you to put your hand up high. No shame in that game. One, it's the greatest commitment you could ever make. Two, he already committed for you. All you got to do is receive. Three, if that's you, put your hand up, raise it, keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. God, I want to thank you for every hand raised. It represents a heart saved. I thank you for the commitment of following you that was just made. I thank you that the freedom and the forgiveness and the, the joy of your salvation is now rushing in to each and every identity that put their hand up high for you. God, I thank you that there is new life, new beginning, that the old is gone, the new has come. Give us the ability as a church to be committed, sold out 100% to saving people, to seeing lives changed in this county. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask this in the precious and the holy name of your amazing son, Jesus. And the whole church said, come on, and the whole church said, hey, do me a favor if you're interested in making Hello, a Hello, and welcome to the Connection Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. And here are some ways that you can get connected. Parents, summer fun for your kids starts here at the Connection Church. Check it out. Mega Sports Camp happens June 24th through the 27th, and it's free for kids in kinder through sixth grade. Preteen Camp is August 4th through the 7th for kids in third through sixth grade. The cost is $260 with a $50 deposit due by June 9th. And Elevate Youth Camp happens July 17th through the 20th for students 7th through 12th grade. The cost is $285 and a $50 deposit reserves your child's spot due by June 2nd. For more information or to register for any of these events, you can visit theconnectionchurch.org forward slash events. Are you ready to take the next step towards getting connected? At Connection 101, Pastor Cole will lead you to discover how you can be a part of our mission to change lives and grow in your connection with God and others. It happens Sunday, June 2nd in the conference room at 1.15 p.m. Lunch is served and childcare is available. If this is your first time with us, you're our VIP. So text the word WELCOME to 512-359-3400 and visit the red carpet area to receive a free gift just for you.